Welcome to the Mean Lady Talking Podcast, the tough-talking, advice-giving show by the not-really-mean, mean lady, Susan J. Elliott. Good day, everybody. This is Susan Elliott, host of Mean Lady Talking Podcast, and welcome back to the second in the attachment series. Now, one of the things that I want to tell you guys is that, yes, I've been researching attachment a very long time, and whenever something makes its way into the cultural vernacular, it is almost always misunderstood. And one of those things that we could talk about is personality disorders. I remember I was in court one day, and this woman lost the case. She lost it badly and she deserved to lose it badly and she was screaming and I talked about this in one of the other podcasts she was screaming that the the guy was a narcissist and I could tell you that I can usually spot a narcissist at 20 paces this guy was not a narcissist but it's become one of those words that people just throw around they don't really know what it means and I've done podcasts on what is narcissistic personality disorder and what is a person who's dysfunctional to the degree of not having a personality disorder but still having a lot of narcissistic tendencies and then there's healthy narcissism or healthy ego, healthy self-love, which is self-esteem. And then there's this whole range of things that people think about self-esteem. And even that's very complicated subject when you dig into the actual academic studies. And it's difficult sometimes to get across because people do take things like affirmations. And I've railed against this for many years that people take things like affirmations and they bastardize them. And then people try to use what they've bastardized and they don't work. And then the affirmations get a bad name. And it's not the affirmations, it's the people that have given it short shrift and put it in in a negative light that doesn't belong in. And there's a lot of people on the internet that are looking for ways to make a quick buck, to push a book into onto Amazon using smash words or something like that and get it out there and then be able to say, I have a book. I wrote a book. And I really think that people are doing a disservice because as I've told you guys, I've had issues with my publisher, but self-published books, so many of them are such garbage that the publishing industry is not threatened by their proliferation. They're just not. So that's why I hope when I do my book that you guys really get behind it because I do want to have an editor. I do want to have a book designer. I do want to have a lot of eyes on it so that it's not a piece of crap and so that I can go around and I can promote the book because it's very important. But there's this tendency right now for people to rush all these things into print and that really have no business either being in print or this isn't the person to put them in print. And people will say, well, if you have a book that gives you legitimacy, if you have a crap book, it doesn't give you legitimacy. Anyway, one of the things that I've noticed with the attachment issues is that there's a lot of misinformation out there, a lot of half information. There's all these little quizzes. Oh, take this quiz to find out what your attachment style is. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what somebody's attachment style is. Anyway, um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote Death and Dying, and she wrote Death and Dying for terminally ill patient. And I was about 17 years old when I first read it in Psychology 101 when I first started college. And I knew that she was working with terminally ill patients. She was working with hospice patients. But ever since that time, and I think I read it in the late 70s, people have used the five stages of grief to apply to so many things that it's not applicable for. Even Kubler-Ross herself said that she regretted saying stages because it makes it sound like you go neatly from one to the other. But there's so many ways that that's just not applicable to grief. One of the things that she talks about is bargaining. Now, when you've lost somebody, when you have lost someone to death, there's no bargaining. I mean, what are you going to bargain for? For them to come back? For the earth to top? stop spinning on its axis and all of a sudden this person is no longer dead, no longer sick, no longer anything. They're suddenly back in your life. There is no bargaining and grief with when you when you've lost somebody that you love to death. There's just no bargaining. So a lot of the stuff that she put forth to apply to terminally ill people coming to terms with their terminal illness, coming to terms with their mortality, doesn't apply in any way, shape, or form to a lot of things that it's been applied to. The other thing is that when you follow something in the field, there are things that change. When Freud started his own 
conversations about mourning with Carl Abraham, they went back and forth, back and forth. They wrote letters and they critiqued and amplified each other's work. And even Freud had several epiphanies about mourning over the course of his lifetime. He believed at first that the loved one had to be relinquished completely. But when his daughter died, he knew that he could never do that. He could never give up the love that he had for his daughter. He could never give up the connection that he had to his daughter, even though she wasn't there anymore. It just had to take a new shape. And so he came up with the idea of integration, which is something that I talk about. And with breakups, you integrate things because there are things about your relationship, things about your ex that your ex might have turned you on to. It could be examples that I've used in the past is art, music, movies, TV shows, different things. And at first, when you first break up, it's very painful to think about those things. And you really can't enjoy them because it reminds you of what's no longer there. But after a while, if you've done your grief process, you get to the integration stage where you could bring that stuff back into your life without it being painful. And it's really important for you to understand that some things you have to give up and some things you have to give up after you do like a closure ceremony. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. And some things you don't give up, you integrate them after you've gone through the most painful part of the grief work. When you've had attachment issues, letting go of secondary losses. It could be your house where you live. It could be your apartment. It could be your mutual friends. It could be their family. It could be different things that they gave you. You have a terrible time giving it up because this represents something that someone who loved you that you were attached to gave you. Now, a lot of the attachment researchers and the grief researchers are the same people. And I talk about Colin Murray Parks doing his studies on widows when widows would be scanning a crowd for their husband, even though they intellectually and logically knew that the guy was dead. And I remember after my mother died, I would pick up the phone to go to call her, even though like I'd gone through the whole business about her dying. I had gone through her funeral. I had gone through everything. And still for weeks and weeks and weeks, I would still pick up the phone to go to call her. And those of you that know my work on taking Colin Murray Park's searching mechanism that he took from Conrad Lorenz, who did the studies on the gray lag goose. And gray lag geese mate for life. And when one of the geese die, the other goose flies great distances, many times injuring themselves, hurting themselves, sometimes even killing themselves, looking for the other goose. They're in so much distress. Even if they see the dead lifeless body of the partner, it doesn't compute for them. They don't understand the goose that was their partner that they loved that they cherished who loved and cherished them is gone and all they want to do is find their partner and as Conrad Lorenz found they will fly great distances and they will destroy themselves many times looking for that partner that they are so attached to. And when I was reading all this, I remember it like it was yesterday. I was sitting in a library and I was reading about Colin Murray Parks, who was reading about Conrad Lorenz and John Bowlby also was a fan of Lorenz's work. And I was reading this and it had been many years since I had done the no contact thing with my ex. And I have found my articles from 2006, 2007 that was on the internet where I'm talking about no contact. And I'm pretty sure there's like, I'm the first person that talked about it on the internet, but I was doing it many years before that. I was doing it in the early nineties and I was reading all about this stuff, 94, 95. And I was sitting in a library and I was thinking, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, this is it. This is it. When I was reading about the searching mechanism, that Murray Parks talked about with the widows and likened it to Lorenz's study on the geese, I suddenly went, oh my God, this is what contact is all about. We're searching, searching, searching. It's called the assumptive world. You assume that your life is a certain way. This is my house. This is my partner. This is my job. These are my people. This is what I do every day. You have an assumptive world and that world makes you feel attached to someone and something that makes your life worthwhile. When those 
things go away, your mind goes into a frenzy and it just wants to put the world back the way it knew it. That's what the goose is flying great distances is all about. That's what the widow searching the crowd is all about. And that is what us having so much trouble with no contact is all about. When you have attachment issues, it makes it that much harder because you have attached to somebody. If you've had insecure attachment early in life, if you've had caregivers that were inconsistent or who weren't there at all, and suddenly you have someone as an adult who cares about you, who loves you and shows you signs of attachment, you have a lot of trouble giving it up. And you could be saying, well, this is the mug. This is the coffee mug that my partner gave me and I love it. And I I remember the day that my partner came to my job and gave me this coffee mug and said, I know you love coffee. I know you, I love you. And, and, and here you are. And it's just a little silly gift that I gave you and I love you and, and you love them and everything's wonderful and cozy and grand. And now all you have left is the coffee mug. They're toddled off with somebody else giving them coffee mugs and you're standing there broken hearted. And if you have attachment issues, that's so hard and you're walking around like Ophelia in Hamlet with this coffee mug thing. I just want what this coffee mug represents back. And your friends are like, uh, it's a coffee mug. Uh, stop being crazy and put it down. But it's not crazy. We attach to things. I remember Michael, I've talked about this before. Michael and I's bedroom looked like a Hallmark store throw up in it. We had all kinds of cards, all kinds of trinkets, all kinds of plaques, all kinds of photos, everything. We had all kinds of memorabilia from a honeymoon, from different trips that we took. And we had them everywhere. And it was basically testimony to how much we loved each other. That room just screamed how much we loved each other. And we would get little things for each other. And one time he got a plaque that he had gotten it while he was out. And I don't know where he got it from, but it was a slate plaque that says an old fisherman lives here with the catch of his life. And as some of you know, Michael loved to fish. That was like his big thing. And I think he might have bought it in Bass Pro Shop or something, but he bought it somewhere where he was out one day. And what he did was he came home and he put it on the wall and he put it on the wall without telling me about it and when you walked into the bedroom it was to the right but you didn't see it when you walked in because it was to your right you had to turn around to see it and the first few times that I went past it I actually missed it and then when I saw it I was like oh that's so cute you know it's so cute blah 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 So about a year and a half after he passed, I realized that the room really looked like a shrine and I had to get rid of a lot of this stuff. I couldn't keep living in there. It was like a a mausoleum now. Instead of being a testimony to our love, it was kind of a testimony to me not letting go. So what I did was I went around with each and every item and I took my best friend up into the room and I went around with each and every item and I told her the story behind it. This is who gave it to whom and this is where we were and this is what it means. And when I got to that plaque, when I took that plaque off the wall, I lost it. I just cried and cried and cried. It felt like part of me was going in the box that I was putting everything in. It just felt like part of me was just disintegrating because I remember how cute I thought it was when he brought that home. And when you have attachment issues, when you have a history of insecure attachment. Things like that can bring you to your knees. But it's really important. It's really important. And if you have something like that, some trinkets, some some this, some that, share it with somebody who's close to you. Tell them what it means and then put it away, give it away, throw it away, whatever. If you've got family photos around the house, take them down. And people who have kids will say to me, oh, my kids like them. It's like, but you have to model moving on for your kids. You can't keep pictures of the happy family up on the wall when dad is off living with another woman. Like you just can't do it. If the kids, if those pictures mean something to the kids, and a lot of times I doubt that they really do. The kids are just running around in and out. They're not really paying attention to what's on the wall. But if those things actually mean something to the kids, then offer the kids that for their room. But you need to take it off the wall because you need to model moving on behavior for those kids. So one of the things that we have to do is we have to look at things that we have difficult letting go of and realizing that they are symbols of attachment and that if we have attachment disorder, we are going to have a more difficult time letting go of them. But we should make a bit of a ceremony about it. Say, okay, my ex gave me this. It meant something to me. It symbolized our 
love for each other but now my ex is gone and I need to put this away throw it away give it away do whatever but you have to say out loud either to yourself or with another person who you trust this is what this symbolizes to me but I know that I need to let it go and this is me letting it go one of the things that I look at in the new book is I look at the other person and what their issues are in getting past your breakup One of the things that I make absolutely certain of is that it's all about you. It's all about you. But when you have rejection issues, when you have attachment issues, you have to look at the other person for a few different reasons. One is that just like when I talk to people who have been with an abuser, who've been with somebody who's personality disordered, who's been with somebody who has severe issues, has mental illness, something like that. I explain to them, you need to understand when an alcoholic is active, they are incapable of loving you, incapable of loving you when they're in their disease. You have to understand that when you're involved with a narcissist, they are incapable of loving you, incapable of it. And they have no empathy for you. They never have and they never will. The whole charade that they do at the beginning of the relationship is just exactly that, a charade to suck you in. They love bomb you to hold you hostage. You have to let go of that. When you're with somebody who has untreated mental illness, it's not going to change. One of the women that I write about in the book, there's about six or seven people that I follow through the book and you'll get to witness their transformation through the book. But one of them is a woman who kept thinking that her ex was the person who was on medication and she had done so much for him and she wanted him to appreciate her. But when he went off his meds, he was totally incapable of appreciating her. Not only that, but he just wanted her to shut up. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. That's all he kept saying to her was leave me alone. And she kept going back and back and back, convinced that one of these times he was going to revert to the guy that he was when he was on his medication. There are many people that have bipolar disorder who enjoy the mania. They enjoy it. They get a lot done. Sometimes they're very creative. Sometimes there's a lot of people in the creative arts who are bipolar and they love the mania. They don't want to even out. They just don't want to. But if you're involved with them and they go off their medication, suddenly they're a nightmare to live with. That not only does the mania kick in, but many times psychosis will kick in. Michael was with a woman who when she went into her manic phase, we clean morning, noon, and night. But she also thought that the people next through with devil worshippers. She'd be hiding knives all over the house in case somebody came in, she could stab them to death and one night she almost stabbed her own kid. You can't sit there and go, gee, I really wish you would go back to be the person that used to be. You can't do that. You need to go, look, this person is just not working out. This person has severe issues that they're not dealing with and I gotta go. Now that's the response of a healthy person. But when you have attachment disorder, when you have rejection issues, that's hard for you to do. You still see this person as the person they used to be. That's the assumptive world. Your mind is still trying to put it back together. Your mind is still trying to figure out where did the person I love go? Where did the life I love go? And when you've had attachment disorder, you can't wrap your head around the fact that it's gone. You don't want it to be gone. And you're like the gray lag goose, you know, flying great distances to your own peril. You will get in contact with them. You'll talk to them before you break up. You'll be saying, why, why, why? Let's try again. Let's do this. Let's do that. And I've had many people say this person was my best friend. Yes, but this person is not your best friend now. This person is not treating you how a best friend treats somebody. But in your assumptive world, that's who they are. They're your best friend. And when you have attachment issues, getting rid of that is so hard. Other people, healthy people go, you know what? Screw you. I know my best friend told me when I was talking about having lupus and having become a widow long before I ever wanted to and this and that, she told me the victim thing is getting old. And I was like, victim thing? Like I do not hold myself out as a victim. And I wasn't feeling sorry for myself. I was just basically saying like, these are the setbacks that I've had. That's been real difficult to deal with. But I walked away from that relationship and I'm never looking back because nobody has a right to say that to me. I didn't go boo-hooing in the corner and go, oh, she's my best friend. How could you do that to me? I was like, no, she's somebody who's not acting like a best friend and goodbye. That's the healthy me. The unhealthy me would have been 
chasing after her, trying to prove that I'm not a victim, that I'm not what she thinks I am. And I refuse to do that. I don't do that anymore. And when you have attachment issues, that's what you do. You keep trying to make yourself worthy of this person's care and love. Worthy. You want to be the person they gave that coffee mug to, they gave that trinket to. You want to be deemed worthy. And when they don't deem you worthy, you're rejectable, you're rejected goods, and it feels horrible. And when I work with clients on their attachment disorder, and I'm going to work on this in the new boot camp, if you join with the level on the level two boot camp, I'm going to be working on looking at your ex to a certain degree so that we can look at this person. Now, this person could be simply a person who's not there yet. And sometimes I deal with people and I work with people who weren't even in a relationship. They might have been in a friendship and their feelings changed and then the friend didn't have the same feelings and they can't understand it and they feel rejected. Other times, people are with somebody who has completely who completely fits all the criteria for narcissistic narcissistic personality disorder or antisocial personality disorder. I mean, really extreme people. And the difference between the new book and Getting Past Your Breakup is we do take a look at the other person, but they could be a pretty good person, a pretty good mate, pretty good choice, but they're still not where you are and the rejection is shattering. You think if you could only see what we can be together, but remember the number one thing is wants to be with me. And even if that's the only thing this person is lacking, it's a big thing. And when you have attachment disorder, it's hard to come to terms with that, that wants to be with me is missing because when you go through life feeling that you're a rejectee, you think that nobody wants to be with you. So it's not something you hold against other people because you think it's par for the course, but it's not. People should want to be with you. If you're a good and loving person who's done your best and working hard and living a decent life, people should want to be with you. You shouldn't hold yourself out as a rejectee. And I know that that's hard when it's like down in your DNA. But when you do this work, and if you've been doing the work and getting past your breakup, you're part way there. One of the things you have to do is you have to focus in on what is your attachment to this other person? What symbolizes it? What does it mean? And how do you make use of it. Yes, use of it. You have to take some of the remnants of the relationship and make use of it. And just like when you are with somebody who's personality disordered, you have to have a bit of understanding what's the deal with your ex? What is the deal with your ex? Are they just a person who is not in the same place where you are? Or are they somebody who is severely disordered? Or is it somewhere in the middle? What is it? What is it? And people who have attachment disorders and take rejection hard are usually attracted to people who also have attachment disorders, but a different kind. They have avoidant attachment where you have anxious attachment and you drive each other crazy. They don't want to be engulfed. You don't want to be unattached. And you do this dance where you go round and round and round. It's fear of commitment, fear of abandonment, doing the dance that they do. You are afraid of being abandoned and you you chase after somebody which causes them to be abandoned. You have fear of commitment and your uncertainty the way you behave in relationships triggers uncertainty in your partner and then they chase after you and they cling to you. You each have become the nightmare that you don't want in your life, the exact nightmare you don't want in your life. Those relationships don't work out and you will just repeat the pattern over and over again if you don't do something about it now. You have to realize you're not going to change this other person. And as long as you have attachment issues, you're going to be attracted to and partner with people with attachment issues, only the other side of the coin. And you are never going to be in a healthy relationship because you just can't be. It doesn't work. If you have fear of abandonment, you probably had a parent who abandoned you. If you've had, if you have fear of a commitment, you probably have a parent who was overly involved in your life or enmeshed you in some way. Or maybe sometimes people get fear of commitment when they've had a parent leave. They've gone to the 
opposite extreme. Instead of having fear of abandonment, they have fear of commitment because even they think that everybody leaves. So you've got two people in a relationship thinking everybody leaves. And what do they do? They build a relationship that's impossible to stay in. So they fulfill each other's prophecy that this isn't going to work out. You're going to leave too. And when we expect certain things from people, even if it's an unspoken subconscious expectation, it comes true. It comes true. We do the things that make them go away. If we have fear of abandonment, we will absolutely push people out of our lives. But the first thing we do is we partner with people who will be easy to push out of our lives. And we're going to continue to do that. No matter how self-aware we become, we're going to continue to do that. If we don't go back and dig into exactly where does this come from and what do I need to do about it? John Bowlby said that the inability to be cared for in a consistent, loving way in childhood leads to disordered relationships in adult life. It interferes with your ability to bond with other people. That's why you're attracted to people with commitment issues because it's not easy to bond to people with commitment issues. They're your people. So on one hand, you have a fear of abandonment. On the other hand, you have a need to cause the abandonment. You're never going to get close to that person and that's just fine with you, even though you think that's exactly what you want. Even though when the relationship ends and you feel a rejection, all you feel is you just want to be with that person. But there's part of you that's scared to death of that because you don't know how to do it and you're convinced that everybody leaves. You have to learn to trust yourself. You have to learn to be okay okay with you. You have to learn to reject the rejector. And that's a big thing. And I don't mention that in getting past your breakup because it's all about putting the focus on you. But if you have attachment issues, you have to reject the rejector. You have to spend some time looking at this person, looking at their issues, look at what's going on, get out of the pie in the sky, get out of who they were when you first met, get out of, you know, the love bombing, if that went on, get out of all those memories, get out of the idea of this is my best friend, this is the person who loves me, this is the person that I want in my life, get out of all those fantasies, they don't work, it's not true, and it's not helping you. When I was studying John Bowlby, and I was studying Colin Murray Parks, and I was studying Conrad Lorenz, and I read about the gray lag goose flying great distances, I thought this is what contact is all about. When you have attachment disorder, no contact is so hard. And I know that I was the first person on the face of the earth to connect those important studies to why no contact is so hard after breakup. And I was writing about no contact early, early on on the internet. In the early 2000s, I was writing. I have it. I can I can show it to you. I have web pages where I'm talking about no contact. And then it exploded years after that. But it came originally from here. And it came from me understanding what John Bowlby, Colin Murray Parks, and Conrad Lorenz were talking about with the searching mechanism. And when you have attachment disorder, the searching mechanism is, is on high alert. You absolutely want to put all that stuff back because you want to bond with somebody and the bond has been stripped away and you don't know what to do. The only thing you know how to do is try to make contact. And that's the worst thing that you can do. You have to commit to no contact. The first thing that you need to do if you've had rejection issues, if you feel like a rejectee, is you have to take a look at your relationship. Step back and take a look at your relationship. If you've done the relationship inventory, you have to do a little bit more. You have to write about your assumptive world. What was the assumptions you were making when you were in that relationship? You have to think about what is my world? What did I assume by how this world operated? Then you have to look at your ex. How did my ex fit into my assumptive world? And what was going on with them that I just couldn't see because I was blinded by the bonds that I thought we had. You have to take a look at that. You have to look at what do I need to do to make my world all by myself, a good world to live in. And you have to reject the rejector. Get rid of all this nonsense about that person was my best friend. That person was the love of my life. That person was the one I committed to. No, that person's gone. Get rid of all those accolades that you've been pouring on them. It's not worth it. It's not good. It's not okay. And it's going to keep you stuck. Don't do it. You have to realize that the fear of abandonment deep inside you gravitates towards fear of commitment deep inside someone else. And until and unless you deal with your fear of abandonment, 
it's never going to work out. It's not true that everybody leaves. You have to get rid of that thought. You have to go to the GPYP workbook and you have to look at the even those statements. Even though so-and-so left, I'm still lovable. I'm still worthy. I'm still a good and loving partner. You have to do those, even those statements. You absolutely have to do them because otherwise you're going to continue to see yourself as rejected goods. You're going to continue continue with the searching mechanism to put your assumptive world back the way it was and the way that it was doesn't work. Your partner left, your partner walked out, your partner is no longer there. That world does not work anymore. You have to give it up. You have to stop flying great distances at your own peril. You have to stop and say, I'm alone now and that's okay. I can do this. I can handle this. I need to parent my inner child who was abandoned. I need to stop and I need to soothe myself. I need to find out what has been the patterns of my relationship. Go to getting past your breakup. Do the life inventory. Do the mother inventory. Do the father inventory. Figure out these patterns. Figure out what's going on with you. And I'll continue on in the next part of this. But if you have attachment issues, if you've been feeling like rejected goods, if you think you're a rejectee, there is hope. There is absolute hope. Hang on to that hope. It's real and it's true and you can have it. Take care, everybody. I will I will meet you here again in the third part of this. And the fourth part for anyone who has a Patreon account for 99 and above. Talk to you all soon. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.